Maureen, can we, oh, we are recording, excellent. Um, it's now 1.30, uh, March 17, happy St. Patrick's Day. I uh, call the meeting of the board directors of Mod 6 to order. Um, Brian, uh, could you take us through the procedures for the meeting, please? This is Brian, uh, happy to, Neil. Welcome everybody to the Montgomery County Mud <clears throat> number six board of directors meeting for Wednesday, March the 17th, 2021. I appreciate everyone being able to attend the meeting remotely today. As in prior meetings, I'll briefly go through the remote meeting procedures and then we'll perform a roll call. So to begin with, I need to remind everyone that meeting's being recorded as required by the Texas Open Meetings Act. Second, please remember to state your name before you speak, including the making of any motions. When you're not speaking, please be sure to mute your line. Third, we'll continue the practice of having a roll call to vote on each motion. After a motion has been made and seconded, please wait until you hear your name called and then respond with a verbal aye, a nay, or an abstention. Finally, we need to identify each person who's joining the meeting remotely today so that we can accurately reflect the attendance in the minutes of the meeting. I'll perform a roll call for the board members, followed by staff and consultants. When you hear your name or your company called, please respond by indicating that you're present in the meeting. Likewise, if you need to leave the meeting before it adjourns, please announce that you're doing so before you disconnect. Once I've completed the roll call for directors, staff, and consultants, I'll ask for any members of the public to identify themselves for the record. So starting with our board of directors, Neil Gaynor. Present. Brooke Hamilton. Present. Deborah Sargent. Present. Brian Cucci. Present. Bruce Cunningham. Present. That completes the roll call for our directors. We'll move on to Woodlands Water staff. Jim Stinson. Present. Mike Mooney. Present. Maureen Bourgeois. Present. Jeannie Scott. Present. Shelley Lawson Kennedy. Present. Any other members of Woodlands Water in the meeting? If not, we'll move on to San Jacinto River Authority staff. Ron Kelly. Present. Chris Meeks. Present. Matt Corley. Not here. Okay. Anyone else from the River Authority staff in the meeting? Here in Sindelwolf. Okay. Anyone else? If not, we'll move on to MUD-6 consultants. Do we have any MUD-6 consultants in the meeting today? If there are none, we'll move on to members of the public. Do we have any members of the public present in the meeting? We need to identify you for the record as well. This is Paul Brown. Um, I, live in, I, I, I live here for 33 years and I'm a director of MUD-47. Laura Norton, MUD-47. Arthur Breedahoff. Go ahead, sir. Aaron Hofstetter, resident Mud Six. Arthur Breedahoff, resident in the Woodlands and live in Mud uh, 47's area. This is Brian. Any other members of the public? If not, Maureen, does that cover everyone who's logged into the meeting today? That covers everybody. Okay, that'll complete the roll call. Neil, I'll hand it back over to you to begin the agenda. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Brian. This is Neil Gaynor speaking. Um, okay, moving on to uh, agenda item two, receive comments from the public. Are there any comments? Yeah, this is Paul Brown. I'll start off. Um, you know, I've been thinking quite a bit lately about infrastructure. Uh, recently uh, revisited the plan from uh, March, March tw 2020 for infrastructure you know, uh, from San Jacinto and then the most recent uh, project plan executive summary. Um, and uh, you know, we're talking kind of big numbers here, $200 million over the next 10 years, which frankly, I think is a little insignificant, uh, perhaps on a base of uh, above a billion dollars or around a billion dollars of uh, assets above and below ground. We'll push that to the side. We also have some other issues 
uh, that are not in this number and they're significant. And uh, you guys probably know about them or you'll hear about them. Um, what, I, what I quickly started to understand is that uh, we're becoming and are going to becoming uh, as, our, as our infrastructure wears out, a, uh, you know, an a company that's uh, substantially focused on renewing infrastructure. And, uh, you know, I'd like to suggest that we look at the process we do now and change it up a little bit by, by separating this part of our business uh, from the routine day-to-day -day operating uh, environment to some extent from a management extent. I think we also need to look beyond one-year financing of uh, this infrastructure. Um, in the in the out of the 200, 200 million roughly, you know we've only finance, we've only committed to financing for the first year. Um, I have to wonder about that because many of these issues are longer term. Uh, the third thing I think is that you know who's paying for this, and uh, what's it going to do to uh, the people who pay for it, our customers. Okay, and I'd like to suggest that we break this number out. And that we start presenting it on our bills to our customers, okay, so that they have an understanding of where, what ultimately I think is going to be uh, their higher price of water's uh, uh, expense goes. Um, I don't expect that between the variety of issues we have out there, whether it's, uh, you know, surface water uh, versus, you know, that, that versus or infrastructure and a bunch of other things that the, the cost to customers going down. And I think it makes a lot of sense to tell them where, where the infrastructure falls and how much money is going there and what they're paying for over time. The other thing I think we need to understand as, a, as an organization is we're doing, let's call it 200 million. What does that mean in terms of the actual bill? What's the bill going to look like in the seventh year for Paul Brown, who lives here, or any of you guys, you folks who live here, right? And we don't have that. We don't project it on an annual basis that I know of, and uh, we don't project it necessarily against these future investments. And uh, so I think, you know, we should seriously consider these kinds of changes. And I'll end there. And, uh, you know, my number's available if anybody wants to chat about it, but, um, you know, uh, just some thoughts wanted to put on the table. Thank you for your, uh, for your attention and allowing me to attend. Okay, uh, this is Neil Gaynor again. Thank you, Paul, for your comments. Are there any other comments from the public at this time? Uh, Mr. President, Arthur Bredehoff. I'd Go like ahead, to share Arthur. some, thank you, sir. I'd like to share some comments and observations uh, about the um, agenda item that you have on your agenda today dealing with the uh, groundwater surface water budget uh, pumping mix for fiscal year 22. Uh, in, in your packet, uh, you have a memo from, uh, dated May 13th from the Woodlands Water um, Subcommittee, which at the time I was a trustee and chaired that committee. And one of the recommendations we made to the trustees, and this memo you have in your packet was approved by the trustees, was to look at each year the mix of groundwater surface water with a goal to move to 50-50 in, in any given fiscal year. Um, today, we know that the mix is 35% uh, uh, surface water and 65% groundwater. And um, I think you've all had the presentation made by uh, San Jacinto River Authority, a great study called the aesthetic well levels uh, for the period of 2010 to 2020. And in that study, there's a chart that shows that when we started surface water and we pumped at a level of 65% surface water, we saw that the aquifers started to recharge and that there was a positive impact on slowing down subsidence. Then when we shifted to 50-50, there was still a positive impact on uh, aquifers and still a slowing down of subsidence. Then in 2019, we shifted to only 35% surface water, and we saw that the aquifers in, were impacted in a more negative way, and subsidence uh, was also impacted in a negative way. 
so that study was quite insightful and it clearly shows good indication that when the level of surface water is higher than 35%, there's definitely a positive impact to the aquifers and subsidence. And we know in our community that there's been a lot of work done by various folks towards GMA 14 and the Lone Star groundwater to try to get some reasonable DFCs and really start to positively impact the aquifers. So I would really ask that you have a good discussion today, support your trustee, and have your trustee at the April meeting give a positive indication to uh, San Jacinto River Authority uh, that they should study for fiscal year 22, a, a mix of 50-50 surface water, groundwater uh, for that uh, coming budget year. Also, you, we wanna know what's the impact to our customer. The impact to our customer for fiscal year 22, based upon fiscal year 21 numbers that we have, it will be about $2.30 higher than where they are today. Today are at $28 and in 20 and fiscal year 22, they would go at $31. Yes, it's in an increase, but it's a small investment that our residents can make towards a positive contribution for our aquifers and subsidence. I thank you for the opportunity. It's great to be here with uh, uh, the MUD directors and we thank you for your service. Okay, this is Neil Gator again. Thank you, Arthur, for your comments. Uh, are there any more um, comments from the public at this time? Yes, I would like to just quickly say happy St. Uh, Patty's Day you to identify everyone. Yourself, please? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, Laura Norton. Um, happy St. Patty's Day. Uh, I just wanted to say I'm here again you know, just for the quality of deliberations that MUD6 has, and I appreciate you all. Okay, uh, th thank you, Laura, I appreciate that. Um, and uh, I think we are just about the end of public comment. Any, any other comments? Uh, going once, going twice, okay. Moving on to agenda item three, receive president and director's comments. And let us start with uh, comments from uh, any of our MUD6 directors. Uh, okay, uh, well, I have one comment. Um, uh, at uh, the March 11th uh, <clears throat> San Jacinto Regional Flood Planning Group meeting, uh, the board approved a position of upper watershed, something I've been pushing for for some time since the formation of the of the uh, of the group. Um, we had no representation, or there was no representation of a category representing the upper watershed where we live, and so I thought that was a substantial oversight. Uh, that there's a whole region not represented. Uh, the next step, and I wanna thank all of uh, the MUD uh, directors and organizations here in this area who supported uh, this idea. And um, the next step is to, um, for nominations. And I plan to uh, nominate myself and I would appreciate your support in the future um, uh, to attain membership on the board. So that's all I have to say about that. Um, so moving on to agenda item four, consider an act on request for adjustments to or relief from the specific charges imposed by the district. I guess that would be over uh, to you, Mike. This is Mike. I, I have nothing for mud six this month. Mike, a, a question. If people do have and want an exemption, do they all have to apply individually? Yes. So they, they should send in a request get by email. Will that be sufficient? Yes, absolutely. The, the instructions are on our website. Thank you. Okay, uh, this is Neil again. Any more questions for Mike? Okay. Hearing none, we're moving on to the consent agenda. I'll read up the uh, five items. Um, review and act on the minutes of the February 2021 Board of Directors meeting. 
Item six, review and act on the financial reports and disbursements of February, 2021. Item seven, receive the tax collector's report. Item eight, consider and act on approving attendance and expenses for district and or Woodlands Water Trustee business. And nine, uh, receive the San Jacinto River Authority <clears throat> Woodlands Division report. Does any director wish to move any item in the consent agenda into the regular agenda? Okay. Um, does any director have comments or questions on any of the consent agenda items? Okay, um, therefore I ask for a motion that we agree to the items in the consent agenda as presented. May I have a motion on the floor, please? Bruce Cunningham, motion to approve the consent agenda. This is okay, Brooke we Hamilton. have a motion. Uh, I'm sorry, I missed that. Brooke Hamilton will second. Okay, we have a motion and a second on the floor. Is there any further discussion? Okay, Brian, let's take the vote. Okay, this is Brian. If there's no further discussion on the item, we will call the vote. Neil, how do you vote? Aye. Brooke? Aye. Deborah? Aye. Ron? Aye. Bruce? Aye. Motion carries. Okay, thank you everyone. Uh, moving on to our regular agenda, item 10, uh, receive the attorney's report. And I presume we're gonna be talking about as part of that report, the CON 10 policy. Over to you, Brian. This is, this is Brian, that's correct, Neil. Um, a few items to cover under the attorney's report today. Uh, first, as I'm sure all of you know, the governor did um, roll back the mandatory mask restrictions and business restrictions that have been in place uh, since last summer. Those uh, uh, rollbacks went into effect last Wednesday, March the 10th. Some questions arose as to whether or not the governor's actions last week impacted his disaster proclamation that suspended the in-person meeting requirements under the Texas Open Meetings Act. We have been in contact with the governor's office about that issue and have confirmed with the governor's office that the actions last week do not impact in any way his disaster proclamation. So we do remain in a remote meeting environment at this time. Uh, we'll of course keep you apprised of any changes uh, to that disaster proclamation, but for now it's status quo as far as remote meetings are concerned from a legal perspective. Uh, from a, uh, from a uh, logistics perspective, it, um, uh, possibility of holding in-person meetings in the coming months. Jim's gonna cover that uh, under his GM report. We've had a couple of questions from other boards about that issue. So he'll cover that under the GM report. Second item need to cover with the board today, as Neil alluded to, the content policy, construction 10 uh, uniform policy regarding the um, uh, developer advance of funds for construction of public infrastructure that will be conveyed to the district and, and purchased by the district in the future with bond proceeds or operating proceeds. We had received a request from, um, from a board a few months back to take a look at that since that policy had not been updated since 1995. Uh, have looked at it, have made some revisions to it. I believe those were circulated by email uh, on Monday, Shelly sent that out. They were also uploaded to the Google Drive. Um, the long and the short of it is the primary uh, purpose of the changes that I made to the policy were to um, modify the structure of the policy to have more references to the underlying uh, applicable codes, whether it be the administrative code or water code or what have you. Uh, the original version of the policy essentially regurgitated a lot of the statutory language. And um, the, the issue with doing that over time is that legislator, legislation will, will pass that will modify uh, you know, any number of statutes from time to time. And if you're just uh, having the specific statutory language in your policy, 
then that could make your policy become outdated if the legislature updates the statute. So included more direct code references so that in the event the legislature does uh, modify any of these uh, statutory provisions, our policy would remain current uh, because it would uh, uh, include any modifications of those applicable statutes over time. So that's, that's the primary thrust of the comments or the revisions. Uh, also did update the the term of these content letter agreements uh, for for some reason frankly don't really know why uh, the the old original policy from 76 1976 had a five year term that's not the industry standard the industry standard is is 15 uh, years on these types of reimbursement agreements I, I you know I'm speculating but back when the uh, Woodlands was really uh, humming on new uh, residential construction. Uh, perhaps it was possible to have a reimbursement agreement entered into public infrastructure put in the ground and value created in the district in that short of a time frame to be able to com complete the reimbursement process. Uh, but that is um, very um, not is not typical at all and I, I don't even think it would be typical in in the woodlands at this point so i uh, did change the term of these agreements to be in keeping with what standard for all of our other district clients uh, the content policy is not an action item today uh, it's just for review and discussion i do anticipate having items on all the mud agendas next month for the boards to consider uh, approval of the updated policy. We don't have a whole lot of districts left uh, that have potential developer uh, funded projects that will be reimbursed pursuant to a con 10. But since this is a uniform policy, all the districts will need to consider approval of it uh, to have it be updated. So we'll have that on the mud agendas for next month. And ha happy to answer any questions the board may have on the, uh, the proposed revisions to the policy. Uh, thank you, Brian. Uh, any questions uh, for Brian? Okay. And finally, the only um, other item I have is well, uh, uh, let us there for sorry, go ahead. sorry, sorry, Brian. <laughs> yeah, so several things to cover today. The last is, uh, as you may know, there's been some uh, some significant damages throughout the woodlands uh, related to a fiber optics contractor, uh, Takis, and their numerous subs. Uh, we, we, we are uh, aware of the issue. Jim and I have had uh, several calls to talk about the issue and, and how to get it solved. Jim is that, has also met with, uh, with the commissioner and uh, Commissioner Nowak and with Takis. He's got to cover that, some of the GM report. But from a legal perspective, uh, we have uh, engaged outside litigation counsel and won't get too much in the legal strategy in open session, but um, there, there will be um, uh, uh, all necessary um, legal remedies will be pursued if uh, Takis doesn't come to the table very quickly and uh, make the changes that are necessary to stop the damages to our facilities. And that's all I have. Okay, this is Neil again. Uh, th thank you, Brian, and apologies for my interruption. Uh, uh, just a, a, while we're on this topic of talk, talk us, uh, uh, Jim, are you going to cover the damages in Mud Six specifically when you uh, come to your report? No, I'm not prepared to do that today. Um, uh, well, the, the reason I ask uh, at, at the trustees meeting, I thought the, uh, was it Mike indicated like there were a hundred instances of breakage uh, or, or disruption or whatever. Uh, and there was a considerable sum of money involved in doing the repairs and such. Yes, we, we can talk about that. Well, uh, yes, it's about a, over $120,000 uh has been uh damage done to date over a hundred waterline breaks throughout the woodlands yes 
Okay, well, we'll we'll uh, we can cover that briefly then. Yeah. Thanks, Jim. Appreciate that. Well, um, not all of it's been back charged to the muds to the, at this point. It's uh, yeah, it's been accumulated, and and I, I don't have a breakdown per mud what what that is today, but I can certainly work with staff to get that put together. Okay, uh, appreciate and Jim, that. this is Ron Kutchie. Is any uh, mud six director or anybody? Uh, at this meeting, aware of any damage that's been done by Tacus within Mud Six, I, I'm I'm not, but I'm aware of quite a bit of damage they have done elsewhere. I, I, this is Neil. I'm not aware of damages here, but I just thought that it'd be worthwhile uh, if we had that. If we had damage, it'd be useful to know. And, and we're happy to get that to you, just, we just don't have it broken down for mud today. We've been okay. too busy trying to deal with the bigger picture than to break it down for mud. Here you, here you, Jim. Okay, um, let's move on to agenda item 11. Uh, <clears throat> consider an act on modifying how the maximum sewer volume is calculated for water bills issued from February 2021 to February 2022, and I know you sent uh, Jim. You sent out a a, uh, a note about that to all the directors. Um, yes, sir. Could you yeah. uh, take us through that? Uh, yeah, again, right. Uh, immediately after or during the freeze, uh, we were needing to calculate uh, water bills, and uh, the email that I sent out explained that every year. We take December, January, and February water volumes, water consumption per household. We take that and average that number, and that is the maximum sewer volume any customer is charged going forward. In other words, when they get into June and July and they're watering their yard, their sewer charge is capped at whatever their winter water average is. Well, <clears throat> as luck would have it, these breaks were occurring throughout the woodlands on customers' uh, water lines because of the freeze. And, and because of that, their water volume was up, uh, in many cases, much higher than it would have been. So we made the decision not to utilize that February meter uh, consumption and, and rather and calculated their bill for the February based on last year's average of, of water over December, January, and February. What we're asking you today is to give us permission to carry that number forward for the rest of this year and recalculate a sewer volume maximum next February or February of 2020 for the following year. We think this uh, recommendation will have a neg negligible impact on the MUD budgets, part of that being because we send the San Jacinto River Authority our meter readings, and then they turn around and bill us over what we tell them the number is. So uh, I think it's the fair thing to do to the residents, considering they've already been through a lot, many with the break and the inconvenience and a whole host of other things. And it uh, really will be negligible impact on the budget. So we're requesting that you allow us to continue this year with the same maximum sewer volume for your customers that was calculated last year. And I'll just emphasize sewer volumes don't vary much per household uh, uh, unless something major happens in the household, they're pretty consistent throughout the winter months. So that is my request and recommendation. This is Ron Petchy, uh, Jim. I think that's very fair and, and frankly, the right thing to do under these circumstances. So I applaud your uh, suggestion. This is Deborah. Yes, thank you, Ron. Uh, this is Deborah ahead, Sergeant. Deborah. Jim, do you know um, if all the other MUDs are in agreement with this as well? So far, all have been supportive and agreed to it, yes. Thank you. This is Neil. Are there any more questions for Jim from other directors? Uh, I'd like to make a motion to approve the revised sewer rates for this year. And, and before we call the vote, I just want to add, we, we also had reported that we may 
uh, see a need to request some streamlining or modifications to our, our water bill adjustment policy, RNS 14. And, and the more we've looked into that, we think that we can utilize the existing policy and meet the customer's needs in a timely manner. We're, we're not seeing an overwhelming number of requests at this point to do any modifications to that. So we're only asking that you uh, modify the, the sewer calculation today, not any water calculation. Okay, this is Brooke Hamilton uh, and I'll second the motion. Okay, we have a motion to approve the modification of the calculation of the maximum sewer volume as, as discussed. Um, are there, is there uh, any other discussion? Okay, let us go to the vote. Brian, please. This is Brian. If there's no further discussion, we'll call the vote. Neil, how do you vote? Aye. Brooke? Aye. Deborah? Aye. Ron? Aye. Bruce? Aye. Motion carries. Okay, this is Neil again. Thank you, Brian. Uh, thank you, directors. Uh, absolutely the right thing to do. Um, so pleased. Okay, moving on to agenda item 12, review information regarding MUD 1 and MUD 6 consolidation study. Um, well, from my perspective, uh, you know, Brooke and I have, have a request in to Woodlands Water on some issues or questions we had. Um, and I realize that there's been uh, the staff is challenged given all the circumstances of recent times, but I'm hopeful that Jim could give us some uh, update on, on this topic. Um, and I, I have to confess, we haven't had the opportunity to sit down and go through those questions yet and, and get responses to you. I've reviewed the questions uh, several times, but just no responses. We, we have literally been in an overwhelmed position with uh, a number of topics, the AMI, the TACUS, and uh, the freeze, and, and we're just requesting a little more time. It's, it's, that can't be more simple than that. Uh, this is Neil again. Uh, thank you, Jim. Uh, I'm in no rush, I can assure you. Uh, I, this, this is something that uh, Every I needs to be dotted, every T needs to be crossed, every issue needs to be looked at uh, to determine whether or not this is to the advantage of our uh, customers in month six. <clears throat> and that's my position on that. And I'm sure that uh, my fellow directors will feel the same. So, okay, moving on now to item 13. Um, Receive information from SJRA staff regarding review of groundwater slash surface water delivery ratio for FY 2022. And I'm not sure who's gonna be taking that one. That would be me, uh, Ron Kelling, SJRA. Um, uh, Arthur did a very good job of kind of laying the, the groundwork for all this, uh, the, referring to the memo uh, 2020, um, with the recommendation of the Groundwater Surface Water Committee to evaluate this delivery ratio uh, each year, which is shown on page 21 of your packet. And you look at page 22 in your packet is a simple one page calculation um, showing the difference. Uh, and as Arthur said, um, we're in the middle of our 2022 budgeting process. Uh, so we don't have that data. So we use data from the current 21 budget. Uh, as you know, the uh, Woodlands uh, charges their, cust their retail customers $2.88 for the blended rate, which is to pay for the GRP. So for the average Woodlands residential customer that uses 10,000 gallons of water per month, then that total monthly bill on average is about $28.80. If the Woodlands would want to go to a 50-50 blend, uh, we're, we're planning on our budget to be at 12, 12 MGD 
uh, to keep our operating costs low, which would be all of our, all the folks that receive surface water would be at 35%. So if the woodlands would wanna go to 50%, they would have to basically pay for the additional production costs, which is primarily power, water, and chemicals to get that extra two and a half MGD um, of surface water and, re and to, to replace groundwater. That additional cost would bump up your, um, your blended rate so that each Woodlands customer of 10,000 gallons each month would pay $31.10. So that difference is $2.30. So I guess the, the question before the MUDs are, do, do you want to increase your surface water blend from 35% to 50%? And that would mean approximately um, two dollar and thirty cents a month more for each customer of ten thousand gallons. We're not asking for a commitment today. We're just seeking guidance uh, because in order to do this, we would have to develop a, a rate for this. We are in the middle of doing uh, rates for GRP. Uh, once we go through the rate. Uh, and budget development process for GRP, we would come back later this year, probably May, uh, and let you know what that number is. Um, and so that we can incorporate that into the um, Woodlands Division budget. So I would be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Hey, this is Neil again. Uh, th thank you, Ron. Say, I, I did have a question about the balance between gra uh, groundwater and, and uh, surface water. Mm -hmm. So going back to page 18 in our packet, it shows uh, in the Woodlands Monthly Operations Report um, for the past few months and uh, coming up, uh, I guess the last month was February, we're right, we're sitting almost exactly at the current time on a a 50-50 blend. Uh, I mean, are you seeing what what I'm seeing in that graph? Yes, uh, there's two reasons and, and, and Chris could probably elaborate further, but there's two things. One is at the end of the year, Chris was trying to uh, keep within our groundwater permit. Uh, so they bumped up the use of, of surface water, which is easier to do on a percentage wise in the winter time because you have a lower demand. Uh, what you're going to find this summer, once we particularly get into May, June, and July, that percentage of surface water is going to drop down because it may be the same amount of surface water being provided, but because your total demand is going up, your percentage is going to go down and it will probably end up somewhere around 35%. That'd be correct, Chris? Yes, sir. That's spot on. Okay, uh, this is Neil again. Thanks uh, to both of you for, for that. Uh, very, very helpful in understanding how this mix will change uh, during the year. Um, <clears throat> are there any other questions uh, from the directors for Ron or, or Chris? Uh, <clears throat> this is Brooke Hamilton. I've got a question uh, referring to the uh, report on page 21 of our, our summary where it talked about a short-term strategy of increasing the groundwater ratio to reduce the operating expense. And I'm wondering, uh, is that where we're going in the short term? Um, <laughs> the way things are going right now and in, in groundwater management, I think everything is a short-term uh, deal. Uh, but the answer to your question is, yeah, the short-term strategy of the GRP is to keep the, the production capacity at the plant as, as low as we can operate it at to keep the cost as low as we can uh, as required by our customers. And so that's unfortunately keeps it down at 12 MGD, which keeps everybody at 35%. Um, this idea to go to 50-50 is just a... It's a one-term thing. It's a one-year thing. It's it's not you're committing for ten years or, or, or more. It's just for fiscal year twenty-two because uh, there's so much unknown uh, and and groundwater management, pardon the pun, is very fluid right now. So um, that's about as long-term as we can look right now. 
That does that answer your question? Uh, <laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, thanks, Ron uh, and Brooke, for that discussion. Um, um, something uh, in the back of my mind. Uh, to you know, look, looking further out into the future, and given the uncertainty in uh, the groundwater management side of things, do you all see any need to change your uh, permitted amounts that uh, uh, the Lone, Lone Star uh, will allow you to pump? Chris, do you want to address that? Because I know we've had many conversations about that. <laughs> before we fill out our permit, so. Yeah, the currently the groundwater, uh, the permit through Lone Star for groundwater pumpage is at a 50-50 blend. So it's a, it's assumed that roughly of the roughly 6 billion gallons that we are going to produce, half of that will be groundwater. If uh, we actually move towards the, in state, well, I guess stay at 35% surface, 65% groundwater, then we're going to be looking at roughly uh, 3.8 billion that we're going to need, so another 800 million. And so what happens is, depending on which way we go, if we do, we can either increase the permit amount if we stay on the 35% surface water, or if we don't increase it and we actually need it, then it's there's a uh, disincentive fee that Lone Star charges. And I don't have that number directly in front of me because what it equates to is $10,000 per day. So um, it, it's, it's one of those things that if we don't go to a 50-50 blend and I do need to look at increasing the groundwater permit for another 800 million gallons a day, which is somewhere in the ballpark of another 50 to 100,000 in permit fees, or if I do not increase it, then there's a disincentive fee of $10,000 per day to pay, which is roughly going to be for about 60 days. So about 600,000 in dense incentive fees. So or we adjust the, or we adjust the uh, blend ratio. Or we adjust the blend ratio. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, I just can't help, I can't help but recognize the irony there. They, they have no real <laughs> limits on groundwater pumpage, but if you end up pumping more than you're permitted, it costs you close to a million. <laughs> So this is Deborah Sargent. So how soon do you need guidance from the directors? Uh, we, we're looking for guidance from the trustees in April. In April. Okay, thank you. And of course, the trustees meet before y'all <clears throat> next. Well, I, uh, this is Neil again. Um, I'm glad we're having this discussion. And um, uh I think perhaps we should contemplate um, providing some uh, guidance no. uh, for Ron, our representative, uh, during the trustee discussion. I mean, I, I think that um, I, I have a sense that we probably would be in favor given uh, uh, of, of changing to the 50-50 plan given all, all the surrounding uh, complexity of issues. Um, but I would like to hear from um, all of the directors on, on this as to where we think we need to be going. And I would invite anyone to, to, to speak. This is Deborah, and I'm, I'm totally in favor of going to the 50-50. I think that's the right direction for us to go in. And I think I, that's the guidance I would give Ron. This is Bruce. <clears throat> I would also go to 50-50, but I would like some more discussion and more uh, general information spread about this. Uh, having uh, the trustees vote on it before the MUD directors know anything about it, it ma makes the MUD board relatively ir <clears throat> irrelevant. And uh, I think that we should participate in this and, so, and in some of the other decisions so that we can give our trustee direction. Uh, uh, Brooke, uh, could, could you add to uh, the discussion in uh, what your direction uh, to Ron might be? I think we should have a, at least a long-term directive to pump as much uh, surface water as we can. 
and fight attempts to go in the opposite direction to the best of our ability. This is okay, uh, Ron. Could you... Go ahead, Ron. Yes, I, I appreciate the feedback of all the directors and, and generally I'm very much in agreement with what the thinking is right now. I've got a question for Ron Kelling or SGRA folks. Uh, we've been able to address under a 50-50 program uh, a uh, curtailment, if you will, of subsidence as best as we statistically could going back into those uh, years before we went back to 35, 65 uh, groundwater to, to uh, surface water. I'm wondering right now if we'll be able to uh, measure any arrest of subsidence if we go into a new 50-50 program with the next budgetary year over that next 12 month period, is that statistically possible or do we need a longer term trend analysis? Uh, uh, well, what we will do is we'll monitor the aquifer levels like we do every six months. Uh, and then we will also monitor the PAM site 13 data, uh, which is, um, usually get a couple of data points a year. So a year may not give you enough data. Um, when it's scattered, and, you know, a lot's gonna depend on uh, let, uh, it, is the next 12 months gonna be a drought or is it gonna be heavy rainfall and there's gonna be less usage? You know, it, it, there's so many factors that fall into that. I, I would say you'd need maybe a couple of years on that, but um, I mean, we've gone to 35% blend, Chris, two years ago. Yes, sir. We went two years ago, and we've already seen that trend starting to go back down as aquifer levels going down and subsidence increasing. So it, it doesn't take very long. And I, I think it's important to emphasize the the budget, the GRP budget is not going to be set next month. There's still time to review this and in, in, you know, there uh, another month or two before uh, they actually would pull the trigger and, and move forward with that. Ron, can you kind of explain that process? Yeah, we, we, uh, we will actually uh, provide a draft budget to our review committee on the 12th of April. We'll have discussions on it on the 19th of April, and then they will vote on it. We anticipate they will vote on it in May uh, of this year. And then that, that would kind of set the rate, and then we could calculate the rate from there. And then that would feed into the uh, uh, Woodlands Division budget. And, and Chris, remind me, we will provide a draft Woodlands Division budget. Is it the end of May or is it into June? It's May. May. <clears throat> yeah. It all kind of falls really close in, in step there. Yeah. Okay, this is, uh, this is Neil again. Uh, thank you, Ron. I appreciate everyone participating in the discussion. And I, and I think uh, we are in agreement um, regarding the proposition of the 50-50 blend and uh, uh, Ron, uh, as, as our representative on the trustee board, um, I, I, I think you will carry that, that forward uh, for the trustee discussion and vote, it, should it go in that direction. But I do have one observation, um, and I have a, a query in uh, with Mike Turco of the Houston Galveston Subsidence District. I've been following the PAM 13 data question for some time now. And yes, uh, absolutely true that there is tremendous sensitivity uh, in the compaction of the aquifers depending on the rate of groundwater withdrawal. However, the last data point uh, that's available on the subsidence district website is in December of 2019. So we don't have uh, at least available to me or other members of the public, uh, the 2020 um, readings from that uh, uh, unit <clears throat> uh, near wastewater plant two. Um, 
I haven't had a response yet from Mike uh, Turco, uh, but that's information that will bear on the question raised by Ron just now too, Ron and uh, Chris. Um, do you all know at SJRA, do you all know if there's for more data out there on subsidence from that particular uh, sensor? I, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's more recent than 2018. I'm trying to find Chris. 2019, 2019, Ron. Uh, 2019. December 2019. I'm trying to find Chris the presentation that, that um, Matt made in December. Yeah, yeah. That's what I was. We'll, we'll, we'll look at it. We'll look at it. Okay. Um, yeah, I appreciate that. It's not a, uh, it's not a I looked yesterday site. and it wasn't out there. Yeah. It's not a core site, so it's not continuous, but I think there's something later than 2019. But we'll look. We'll look. I also had a query uh, to Mike about when is the yours cores uh, site going to come on online? Yeah. So anyway, I'm keeping an eye on this. Uh, I, yeah, I'll I've been be, looking I'll be continuing to ask questions. I've been looking for that myself. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, Ron, uh, uh, Ron Kutchi, that is, are, are you okay with uh, where uh, the board uh, stands on the 50-50 uh, blend issue? Uh, yeah, this is Ron Kutchi. Uh, Neil, I think I'm sensing consensus among the directors and I'll be um, more than happy to, to take that message forward to the next trustees meeting. Okay, I really appreciate that, Ron. Thank you very much. Is there any further discussion from the directors on this agenda item? Okay, hearing none, we'll uh, go to agenda item 14, uh, receive the general manager's report. Uh, over to you, Jim. Thank you, sir. Um, I'm gonna highlight the number of items from our trustee meeting. Um, we had a, a spirited discussion regarding wastewater treatment consolidation, the feasibility study that has uh, been on the table, the request for qualifications uh, from consultants to, uh, to start that process. I think uh, to, to kind of summarize, we ended up the trustees wanted more information on what the public engagement stakeholder outreach might look like in that effort. Uh, specifically, uh, we were asked to contact the Woodlands Township um, and, some, and get some feedback from that group. We have a meeting set with uh, uh, Gordy Bunch er, er, uh, and Bruce Reeser, I think, and Dr. Gibbs and uh, some of the staff for April the 1st. So we'll uh, sit down with them and talk about this and then bring uh, their feedback back to the trustees. Ron and Chris, I think, are going to talk a little bit or have some more information on what the public outreach or stakeholder input would look like and how that might evolve as the process moves forward. Uh, we also received the 10-year project plan from SJRA. This is uh, each year they look at a 10-year snapshot. Um, this uh, uh, evaluation of this plan started uh, actually a couple of months ago with our audit committee looking at potential funding options for that. Uh, that was sidelined a little bit with the consolidation study, but that group is going to be back meeting again and coming to the trustees with some recommendations for funding options for the roughly 180 million uh, in repair and rehab that's needed uh, currently over the, or over the next 10 years with the water distribution, or water transmission and wastewater system. Uh, in your packet, I think is a note from the Montgomery Central Appraisal District. They are looking for candidates interested in serving on the board in the category of special purpose districts. You may recall the last uh, couple of election cycles, the Woodlands Township uh, was able to seat a candidate of their choice in that position simply by the, the way it's structured and set up. It's based on assessed value and, and they hold a, a larger share of that decision in the mud. So if you're interested in, in putting your name in as a candidate for that position, you might just recognize the, some of the obstacles that would have to be overcome. 
Uh, we did have a, a request from one of the MUDs to begin meeting in person again, and I reported to the trustees that I don't think we have a full unanimous con consensus or agreement on that with all of our 10 MUDs. And, and I'd like if we begin meeting in person again, that it be uh, together with all the MUDs rather than a mixture of some in person and some remotely. So let's give that topic another month or so to see what plays out, especially from the governor and his waiver that grants us the right and the ability to meet remotely. If he removes that at any time, then that makes that decision for us to go back in person. But uh, and my point is, I'd like for it to be all together rather than a mixture of some in person and some not. Uh, also in your packet is a notice from the Central Appraisal District that the temporary disaster relief uh, is in uh, available to those that had damage either in their home or their business uh, and want a temporary uh, relief on their assessment. So we may be seeing some requests for that as we move forward. We also had a request from a director, uh, Scott Custer, to the River Authority to review their SCADA room, their electronic monitoring and, and uh, uh, room where they uh, kind of the brains, the, chem the electrical brains of the operation. And Ron has offered that he would like to share that or uh, let, let us tour that building. But rather than just one, let's uh, offer to others that may be interested. So Shelly, We'll be putting together a notice for a date and time to go out and any director that would like to see the, the SCADA operation of the River Authority, I think this would be a worthwhile trip and effort to see that. Um, I did report, I think last month that the Lone Star Groundwater District had reached out to a number of stakeholders, uh, us being one, to sit down and meet with a couple of their directors and uh, President Eric Hurd has selected uh, some of our directors to, to do that meeting. Uh, Neil Gaynor was selected, Laura Norton was selected, uh, John Yours was selected, and Eric Hurd will be sitting down and myself with uh, the equal number of direct or representatives from Lone Star uh, in the coming weeks to hear what they have to say and, and be reporting back to you on that meeting. Uh, I know they've also reached out to the township to uh, Southern Montgomery County MUD, uh, I think Porter, SUD, and a number of other what they call stakeholders. So it'll be interesting to see how that all comes together. I'm still working with the two neighborhoods uh, that have concerns on the AMI poles that were installed. We installed uh, over 15 poles around the woodlands, but we've got two locations that uh, have a concern. So uh, I've uh, included in the packet some options for painting, some options for putting in a camouflage type structure, but uh, the, these residents at these two neighborhoods really prefer the poles to be re relocated. And I haven't been able to complete the analysis on if, if that's a feasibility or a possibility. Yes, sir, Bruce Cunningham. Uh, yeah, Jim, could we <clears throat> piggyback on the uh, energy poles by chance? They put AMI in all over. Well, you talking about with Entergy's recent upgrade in their AMI? Yep. Yeah, we looked into that a while back. They're actually utilizing their streetlight poles in the neighborhoods, and we need something much higher for our system. Um, so it, there, there wasn't really an opportunity to uh, put blend technology and get some efficiencies in that. We did have a number of conversations with energy back quite a few months ago, but it, it just, their opportunity wasn't there. Okay. And, and we're working well, we've got, these are the only two locations that are in question that are concerned. So we just have to figure these two out and then we're, we're, uh, we're on our way to, to getting the full AMI signal uh, operational. Um, the, the topic with TACUS, that has been truly an extraordinary challenge, uh, over, especially over the last couple of three weeks. Again, 100 plus damages or le uh, uh, leaks, uh, damage to our facilities. Uh, uh, right now, well over $100,000. Uh, 
uh, a truly an unsustainable uh, path that we're on. And uh, hopefully we can, we have a meeting set for tomorrow that we can come to some understanding to get this to where uh, it's workable for us, TACUS and our residents. Um, in your packet, there is a note regarding a refund from the Woodlands Water Agency Operating Reserve or Operating Account. Each year we look at what our reserve standing is and if it exceeds a certain threshold, we offer rebates to the MUD. So you can look in your packet and see what uh, that rebate will be for MUD 6. Uh, there's also a HARC monthly report in your packet. Um, and uh, at the end, there's a number of compliment emails that we received from residents uh, that uh, requested service during the freeze. And I just want to emphasize that that was an, truly an extraordinary event and a very challenging time for us in particular, our outside field guys. Um, we uh, made, made it through. Uh, another challenge we had was our answering service went down. So we were routing calls to our, uh, our uh, employees at their homes and uh, just a really difficult situation that uh, it looks like we made it through with help from the River Authority with uh, much better condition than many of our uh, utilities in the area. So uh, thank you much to our staff and the River Authority for getting us through that. It's in our rear view mirror now and TACUS is the current challenge. And that concludes my report. Okay, this is Neil again. Uh, thank you, Jim. And uh, I wholeheartedly heartedly agree with uh, the efforts made uh, by Woodlands Water and SJRA in uh, keeping us rolling along uh, during that phrase. Uh, no boil water notice for the Woodlands. Outstanding. So uh, thanks to all. Kudos to those involved. Um, okay. Uh, if there are no more no questions for Jim, we'll move on to um, item uh, 15, receive the Woodlands Water Trustees Report. Over to you, Ron. This is Ron Kutchie. Thank you, Neil. I almost thought I caught Jim missing an item on the, uh, the refund coming back to the MUDs because it was early on the, it was on page 44, but he went right back to it. So he covered everything that was in the trustees meeting. But before I ask if there are any questions on the minutes of the trustee meeting, I'd like to back up and ask Jim Stinson, how Takis got into the woodlands? Did the township have some awareness and, and permitting to allow Takis to enter the woodlands? I, I know they've been in Montgomery County areas like Walden on Lake Conroe and Bentwater on Lake Conroe and who knows whatever, whatever other unincorporated areas they might've entered. But how could they just venture into the woodlands uh, freelancing like that? It, it's just astonishing to me. Do you have any background information as to how they got here? Well, the, they have a, a certain permit, and, and Brian can uh, weigh in on this in, in a minute, uh, from the state of Texas that designates them a certain type of utility provider, which gives them unbridled, unlimited access to the public right-of-way. In other words, the county right-of-way, even Montgomery County has no control over what they do. Uh, that's what stumped Commissioner Nowak and then his group to a point of real frustration and, and doing a lot of research through their legal department, TACUS has uh, somehow obtained this unique permit that allows them full use of the public right-of-way. Uh, they don't have use of our utility easements that may be overlapping or other uh, easements, but if it's in the public right-of-way, uh, it uh, is astonishing the, the powers that they have right now under the current law. Brian, can you weigh in on that? Uh, this is Brian. So that, as Jim mentioned, that doesn't, um, their, their right of access on public right-of-ways does not give them uh, the right to go and damage our um, infrastructure without recourse. So that's what we are working with outside litigation council on and will be taking uh, necessary legal actions very soon uh, if 
if Tagus doesn't um, come to the table and make the sorts of um, uh, uh, concessions or best practices that are necessary to protect our infrastructure. Because as, as Jim mentioned earlier, over $100,000 worth of damage so far uh, that we will pursue um, claims on and uh, you know the number of damages and they're not even fully ramped up yet in terms of the number of contractors that they're ultimately going to have working throughout the district so um that they have they have tried to uh, take a very um aggressive uh, approach with both the county and with us and um, we're not going to stand for it uh, this is Ron Kutchie again. Uh, I, I'm beginning to wonder what TACUS is offering, and this almost smirks of deregulating electricity in Texas back in 1999. And several entities, public entities, including the Wall Street Journal, have published that the residents of Texas have paid $28 billion more than they would have with perhaps a monopoly or an oligopoly on electricity with deregulation. And I guess Tacus's advantage is going to be, oh, we can do fiber optics cheaper than everybody else to a point. So that's just my comment. I don't know where this is headed. Yeah, this is Brian. I, I think we'll have a lot more uh, clarity probably next week, wouldn't you say, Jim, as far as the direction that this is going? You've got a meeting with Tacus, what is it, tomorrow? Um, and then we'll be um, taking appropriate action at, pretty soon after that. That is correct. We have a, a meeting with a specific agenda set for tomorrow at 1 p.m. Um, good luck to you. Uh, and get, getting back to the trustees uh, meeting summary out there and looking at uh, the items that were documented, everything's been covered well. Are there any questions of any of the directors on the minutes of the trustees meeting? All right, thank you. This is Neil. Uh, th thank you, Ron. Uh, good discussion, good report. Appreciate that very much. Um, moving on to item 16. Uh, this is considering an acting on authorized development agreements, et cetera, et cetera. This item has been recurring. It's unnecessary and it should uh, be taken off uh, Appearing on the agenda until we have such a, 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 a moment to consider an act on something concrete. Uh, uh, do I have your, uh, is my understanding of what we discussed correct, Jim? Yes, that's my recommendation that we quit carrying this as a routine item and only put it on when, when needed. Yes, sir. Okay, excellent. We can scratch that one off. Okay, moving on to um, agenda item 17, discuss any matters for placement on uh, future agenda. Um, don't hear anything. Okay, uh, moving on to agenda item 18, it is now 2.38 p.m. And without objection, I adjourn uh, this meeting of uh, the MUD6 Board of Directors, and thank you all for your uh, participation. Good job, President Gainer, and uh, happy St. Patrick's Day. Oh, yes, happy St. Patty's Day, everyone, of course. Thank you, Neil. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you, Thanks, everybody. Good job. Thanks, Neil. Take care, everyone. <laughs>